Hello and welcome to this video on shielding gases used for laser welding. To begin with, let me start by sharing the screen so you can follow along on the PowerPoint that I'm going to share. My name is Girish Kelkar and I am a welding consultant operating as WJM Technologies. Additional information about my consulting business is on the web at welding-consultant.com. There are other videos in the laser welding playlist that might be of interest to you if you are a beginner in this subject, including laser welding fundamentals, types of lasers, laser beam quality, pulse shaping in laser welding, and spot size in laser welding. So let's look at uh, shielding gas. What exactly uh, does a shielding gas supposed to do? The job number one, it is supposed to provide shielding. So here I'm showing you a schematic. We have a focus lens, a nozzle, and the focused laser beam is coming down on a part and uh, making a weld. We are supplying argon through the nozzle and the no argon is coming down and flooding the space over the weld to push out all the other contaminants such as oxygen, nitrogen, and water vapor so that they do not contaminate and react with the fusion metal. Argon is not the only choice. There are many other choices. And let's see what are the choices available for laser welding. Uh, one of the easiest ones, of course, is air. That means no shielding. So you can weld in ambient. In some metals, such as aluminum and carbon steels, especially when the welding is done at high linear speeds, there is not much time to react with the ambient. So you can make weld without shielding gases, especially when you're using high linear speeds, such as those with Galvo welding. The next step up is nitrogen. Uh, nitrogen, even though it is a bit reactive, it is not as reactive as oxygen. So you can actually use nitrogen as a shielding gas, again, for aluminum and carbon steels. And one of the other benefits, uh, apart from being cheaper than argon, is that it reduces keyhole porosity. So there is some chemistry between nitrogen and the keyhole in carbon steels that reduces por keyhole porosities. Argon is the all-time favorite and perhaps the most commonly used uh, shielding gas. And it is inert, so it doesn't react with the molten metal. Also, it is quite heavy. So when the shielding gas comes down, it floods the area and protects uh, the, the melt zone very well. Helium is the other inert gas, which is also often uh, can be used, uh, but it is, first of all, very expensive. Secondly, it is very light. So you have to provide a lot of shielding gas to have good coverage over the molten metal when you use helium. That's why helium is not as commonly used in laser welding as in some cases, say, in arc welding. Though there might be a point where if you are making welds with a very high energy density beam, uh, especially with the new fiber lasers with single mode uh, laser light, there might be situations where argon is getting ionized during welding. And in that case, you may have to switch to helium to avoid the shielding gas from getting ionized. The second job of laser uh, shielding gas is to push away the plume which forms over the weld uh, in laser welding. On the left, I'm showing you a schematic. Again, we have a lens. Uh, the beam is focusing down to a spot. And during welding, as the metal heats up and melts, some of it starts vaporizing and the vapor rises up and some of that vapor also can get ionized. So you will actually see a small cloud of ionized gas and metal vapor uh, above the weld while it is being welded. Now that metal plume uh, is essentially soot and that contains essentially metal vapor. So you want to remove that uh, from the weld zone and two ways to do that is to have coaxial shielding gas. So the shielding gas comes down from the nozzle and spreads it out. Or you can have directional shielding where you can have a side tube, side flow arrangement where the laser, the gas is coming out from the side and it pushes the plume and pushes the soot in that direction. And you can have a vacuum device on the other side to take away all the metal dust and soot uh, to a safe location. So those are the two choices in trying to remove the soot to take them away from the weld zone. And why do we need to do that? 
because if you don't, we can have a visual appearance which is not acceptable. So here I'm showing you an example of two spot welds, uh, seam, so multiple spot seam welds, and this is the last spot. This example was made with shielding gas, and this example was made without shielding gas. So obviously with argon shielding, you can see a very clean weld. With, without argon shielding, you can see that the weld zone has oxidized, and there's also a ring around the weld, which has a darker region, which is where the soot has deposited. Now, again, the soot actually deposits further out also, but it is not enough quantity, so it's not visually obvious, but the soot is depositing not only on the parts, but also on the machine as well. So I took these samples, put it in SEM, and looked at the surface. So when there is argon shielding, the area around the weld has very little uh, indications of anything apart from the natural surface of stainless steel. Whereas the area around the weld, when there is no argon shielding, you can see a fine dust of two micron soot particles around uh, the weld. One of the biggest misconceptions about soot is that soot is likely to be carbon. So that's why I put it in quotation marks over here. Oftentimes, every, uh, people assume that anything which is black soot uh, depositing around the weld is going to be a source from a carbon contaminant. So I took some of the dust from an inconel weld that we were making, put it in an SEM, and analyzed it to find it is actually composed of inconel. So that soot is actually fine metal dust deposited around the weld. So the soot is not carbon, and cleaning and wiping it uh, many, many times is not going to solve that problem. So why does this weld, which has argon shielding, not show any signs of soot? What happens is the soot is still forming. Whenever you make a weld, the metal, the metal is going to vaporize and it is it's going to create soot. The only thing in this situation is the shielding gas has pushed away the soot away from the weld. So it has displaced the soot, not prevented it from happening. So the soot is still forming. It is just displaced away from the weld. Another requirement or another job of the shielding gas is to push away the plume for another reason. One, that is to avoid defocusing the beam. Here again, I'm showing a schematic on the left-hand side. We have the lens, the laser light is focused down. And when you're making the weld, as soon as the weld is in the process of being made with a laser, there is always going to be a soot cloud right on top of it. And that soot cloud, which is an ionized metal and gases, that acts like a defocusing lens. So you're trying to focus the beam down and the, defo the plume is actually defocusing the uh, laser energy. And that can result in a cross-section weld where it looks like a nail head. So I'm showing you a weld between two pieces and this looks like a nail head. And this nail head formation is because of defocusing of some of the beam energy uh, during welding. So if that is not acceptable, that is another reason why you want to wash away the plume so that you don't get this feature in the weld. Researchers have done studies to, far, to try and make a laser weld in a vacuum. And when you do a laser weld in a vacuum, whatever plume is forming is very quickly sucked away. So there is effectively no plume. And they found that with the same energy, when the weld is done in a vacuum, the depth of the weld is almost twice. So it is a very efficient way of making a deeper weld. Uh, however, of course, you need a vacuum environment, but by itself is not very difficult because a lot of electron beam welding is done in a vacuum and would not be very terribly difficult to adapt uh, the electron beam chamber for to make a laser weld. Another situation where environment is very, very critical is when you're making these devices such as uh, medical devices and electronic enclosures where even the tiniest amount of contamination is not tolerated. In those situations, instead of making the laser welding in air and having a nozzle or some kind of a contraption to provide the shielding gas, you do all the laser welding inside a glove box. So the glove box is a box where the environment is controlled and it is controlled down to oxygen to less than 20 ppm and moisture, which provides hydrogen, 
to less than 10 ppm. So very, very clean and dry environment inside. And the welding is done inside and uh, you reduce any chances of contamination. Now the environment inside can be full of uh, completely argon or mixture of argon and helium. So glove box welding is, is quite common in certain industries. Uh, this is uh, glove box by M. Brown. I'm showing you the website over here. M. Brown is a well-known brand for making glove boxes. Uh, although you can buy such glove boxes with built-in laser welding apparatus from many different uh, manufacturers. In summary, there are three main jobs for a shielding gas in laser welding, first is to shield the weld from the ambient. That is the first job, of course, as the name implies, it's a shielding gas. The second job is to push away the plume to reduce soot around the weld because it may not meet the visual acceptance criteria for the weld. And the third job is to push away the plume to reduce the nail head effect if that becomes an issue for your application. Keep in mind that for laser welding, as opposed to arc welding, the shielding gas is passive. The shielding gas is not actually getting ionized during welding, as opposed to in arc welding, under normal circumstances. But there could be a situation where if you are welding uh, with a very high energy density laser beam, there could come a time where your the argon shielding gas itself is ionizing. And in those situations, you may have to switch to helium. On the other extreme, uh, if you're welding at a very high linear speed, uh, such that the welding is happening, the laser is actually creating a melt and freezing in a fraction of a second, and the shielding gas is not very effective at all in those situations. So there might be a situation where the shielding gas is not very effective at all. And in those cases, you might as well make the weld in air. The final thing to keep in mind is the soot that forms around the weld is actually metal deposit, a fine metal dust which is deposited around the weld and also all over the machine. And it is not carbon. So this is one of the common misconceptions in laser welding that the soot which is black in color uh, must be carbon, but that is not true. I want to thank you for your time. And if you are interested in learning more about welding and joining, please do subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking the subscribe button not this one over here, but below on the screen as pointed by, by this arrow. And there are many other videos in this um, uh, YouTube channel in different playlists, including for arc welding, laser welding, uh, welding and metallurgy, and weld design. So hope you find those videos to be interesting. And I want to wish you the best uh, in your efforts to learn more about laser welding and welding in general. Thank you and take care.